Hello, this is Linda Hitt. We're going to take a look at the manual accounting cycle and focus with this videotape on the inputs. Daily entries, adjusting entries, closing entries, and also look at the subsidiary ledgers. Um, first, let's look at the steps in a manual accounting cycle. It's sort of like a three-step waltz that we can kind of look at. Um, daily events are recorded. There's often a source document a bill received or paid that triggers the entry. It's put into the general journal. We update the subsidiary ledgers, which are very detailed records about customers that owe us money, suppliers that we owe money to. So it makes sense it should be updated on a regular basis. Um, by the end of the accounting period in a manual system, which could be monthly, quarterly, yearly, we um, record, we move that data over to the general ledger so we can actually get an ending balance for each of the different ledger accounts. Uh, third step is to check the math and just, just make sure the debit balance accounts equal a credit balance account so we prepare an unadjusted trial balance. Um, then if we do want financial reports we go on to uh, preparing the adjusting entry. So if you do statements once a year you only have to adjust once a year. Um, these are very special entries that are not correcting errors, but they're simply updating our accounts. Um, and again, we'll look at the problem here in a little bit. So we enter the adjusting entries in the same general journal where the daily entries were. We post it to the same general ledger for the reason to get balances once again. And then we do another trial balance, step six, except we call it the unadjusted trial to check the math. Um, we prepare by our income statement balance sheet cash flow on a regular basis. Um, by the end of the year, which is step eight, we want a full-blown 12-month income statement and the other statements with it. Uh, once we finish the 12-month income statement, we're ready to look at closing entries. At that point in time, the temporary accounts, revenues and expenses, and also the dividend account, um, we no longer need those balances, and we don't want to leave them in place and go on to next year, which we'd wind up with 13 months of a, a revenue or an expense. So the closing entry process basically takes the data from the revenue, expense, and dividends and moves it into the uh, retained earnings account. So we're updating the retained earnings account as well. Once we've done the closing entries in the same general journal, we post it to the same general ledger to get balances, and we do number 10, the final trial balance, which we call the post-closing trial, which is very short because it only has the permanent accounts, assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. Um, daily journal entries um, are specifically recorded um, after something has happened. Um, they have to have some impact on assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. Um, again, there's often a piece of paper or document that triggers them. Um, there are some important events like signing a contract that will not affect entries right away. Um, particularly if you sign a contract for a, between you and the customer, if you haven't acted on your service for the customer and the customer is not giving you anything for it, then it's an important event, but it's not yet into your accounting system. So it's not historical, it has to be something um, happening. All journal entries will pick up debits and credits, which means pluses and minuses to various accounts, um, account titles, and then certainly the transaction date. Adjusting entries are often the hardest of the entries to deal with, and we can use the language of accruals and deferrals. Um, in the deferral side, deferred expense and deferred revenues, um, when we purchase something like supplies, we often set it up as an asset because it will benefit the future. So we're deferring the expensing of supplies to later by putting it into an asset account at first. Um, so it, basically it's the same thing we used to call assets used up. Um, we're looking at different types of assets and deciding how much has been used up. Depreciation would fall in this category, as well as prepaid insurance, office supplies, things like that. Um, so normally deferred expenses um, means that we would be debiting an expense and crediting either an asset or crediting a contra asset. Um, so that's a whole category of, of adjustments for things that we own. 
Um, deferring revenues, when we collect money in advance, we cannot record those as earned revenue. So the way we, we set aside the revenues or defer them is to record that it's unearned revenue, which is a liability account. Um, so as part of accrual accounting, we have to be very careful about timing our revenues based on when we actually sell the product, perform the service. Um, so usually in the adjusting entry, because we've already set up an unearned liability, we're going to reduce the unearned revenue by debiting the liability and then we're going to credit a revenue to show what we've earned. On the accrual side, we have accrued expenses and accrued revenues. An accrued expense is a uh, common thing would be if you have a notes payable, you've borrowed money, you owe interest on the loan, but you don't have to pay it yet, we would accrue interest um, so that we would have a debit to interest expense and a credit to interest payable. Um, again, it's our best attempt to pick up all expenses that we've had, whether or not there's been a source document, whether or not you've recorded something in the daily entries. Um, also, the accrued revenue would be a similar type of thing, where maybe we have a notes receivable and we've earned interest on it, but we haven't actually, nothing's triggered the entry. So in the case of um, notes receivable, we would be debiting interest receivable, the asset, and crediting interest revenue. Um, so once again, if you look at the, the, the four categories, and pretty much all adjust entries can be put into one of the four, if we forget these entries, the income statement and the balance sheet will be off. Um, cash flow, no, because these entries do not involve cash. Cash is in the daily entries. But you can see that two of these involve revenues, two involve expenses, and then two involve, I think, assets, and two involve liabilities. So there are very important things, and often this is the place where errors can be made uh, because they are a little more complicated. Closing entries, again, we've mentioned it's done at the end of the period, um, only involves temporary accounts, and certainly does update the retained earnings. So um, in a computerized system, we can close more often because the information can be stored, but in a manual system, it's usually done once a year. Um, so let's go on to the problem that we have. Um, so we'll actually be able to apply some of this. Um, I've just set up some basic entries, about 20 entries, and then some adjusting entries. Um, the first one, since we're brand new, we're going to acquire some money by issuing stock and having owners. So we expect cash is coming in. And we do have a par value, so a little more complicated. I'm going to pick up common stock, I'm going to call it common stock $5 par. Because when you have a par value, then we need to record common stock at par. Um, so we're going to take the 11,000 shares times the $5 par. Pars are often set low. Um, stock can't has to be issued at equal to or above par. It's a legal requirement. Um, you can see that we don't balance, so when you have par value stock, probably you're going to need additional paid in capital as another account, or we can abbreviate APEC. And it's simply going to be the difference between the two. It's just a plug figure and doesn't have a lot of meaning. If the par value is very small, whoops, um, if par value is very small, it's going to be um, very large and it's not a profit, it may feel like it, but when we get to the impact on the statements, um, issuing stock with a par or without a par, the cash you receive will be your assets going up. Common stock and additional paid in capital are both under stockholders equity. Um, they fall under the paid in capital subcategory of this. Um, so the, the end result with or without a par is pretty much the same. Assets on stockholders' equity will go up, so we balance the balance sheet. Um, certainly isn't going to affect your profit or loss or income, and it does affect cash. So cash is going to go up, and it will be under financing. Next, we buy land for cash. So we would expect land to go up, and we would expect cash to go down. So when I come over here for the statement impact, 
we can see the cash is an asset that's going down land is an asset and that's going up so it shows it's zero but it basically means that it's an asset exchange plus and minus I could have written it that way as well um, no impact on the total nothing else on the, on the balance sheet income statement nothing and for cash flow purposes um, of course we do see cash going out and this would be investing next we purchased inventory merchandise inventory and it says on account um, with on account we know that there's no cash so if, if I'm charging something and buying something I'll have to pay later it's going to be accounts payable if it's a customer that's buying something on account then that's when we have accounts receivable so we pick that up inventory of course is an asset uh, accounts payable is a current liability so there's balance sheet balancing the equation balancing until we sell the inventory there's no effect on our income and of course we haven't paid for it um, what we do have every time we use accounts payable we should look up the individual company that we're charging from and keep a separate record so we know what we owe at any point in time so here's the accounts payable <laughs> leave it there and I'm going to set up super supplier company as my subsidiary and as we know it's a credit here in the journal it's going to be a credit in the um, subsidiary ledger and that's going to allow us to, to keep a balance we usually have the terms and everything right there Next, we bought an insurance policy, but we prepaid for an entire year. So it's not going to be insurance expense. It's going to be prepaid insurance. And of course, our cash is going down. Um, so if we look at this, we have minus assets. Whoops. We have minus assets and plus assets. So it's an asset exchange. Again, the total is not impacted. Nothing else on the balance sheet. When insurance expires, it'll affect the income statement. And of course, cash does flow. And if we had paid monthly, it would have been an expense. It would be operating. So prepaying it, still it's operating. So it's, an, it's one of the exceptions. Most of the times we think of investing as being you know, our assets. Well, if it's prepaid insurance or supplies, that's used up quickly um, and is usually treated as operating for cash flow. Okay, next we're going to pay rent, but notice it's paying it for one month. So there's only a one month benefit. We don't need to show prepaid for this one. Um, so we have rent expense and cash. So we do know that our assets are going down. Rent expense is a temporary account that fits under retained earnings. Retained earnings is part of stockholders' equity. So that is also going down. So that's how we balance the balance sheet. Um, we do have less profit. And we do have less cash. So a lot of things are going down. Expenses are put in the operating section for the cash flow. Okay, I think that's it. Um, next, we collected money in advance from customers. So we see cash going up, and because we have not performed the service, we're going to promise to perform the service, so we have unearned revenue. Um, and over here, then, we see that we have more assets, and we have a short-term liability, more than likely. And that balances the balance sheet. Once we've earned the revenue, it will affect your net income and your profit and loss statement, but not yet. It does impact cash. Um, it's customers, so that would be operations. Okay, and then we're now down to purchasing equipment. Um, notice that we didn't pay cash, and we didn't borrow money first. The owners of the equipment that are selling it to us 
are financing it for us. So we have set up a notes payable. And if we have more than one note, then we should have a subsidiary ledger for that. Again, one place we can look to kind of capture all the information. So Zone Company is the name of the company that I have need to pay my money to in the future. It's a credit in the notes payable. It's a credit in the subsidiary ledger. And I would put the terms and so forth there as well. Okay, we purchased supplies on account. And we've seen on account before. So again, no cash. We're promising to pay in the future. So we have resources, we have an asset, we have a short-term liability, and that's our balance sheet. Until um, we use up the supplies, no effect on P&L, and we haven't paid for the supplies, no cash. But we do need to update our subsidiary ledger because we do owe money for this. So this one will go here, and it's Jones Company. Whoops. Um, and we own, owe Jones $2,000. <laughs> okay. So then we can move to signing a contract to deliver goods to Alice Smith. This is December 16th. The contract isn't going to be executed until December 24th. So as far as accounting goes, um, it's an important transaction but there's no entry yet. We have to wait till we actually something has happened to affect the accounting equation. So let's go on to declaring a dividend. Um, we can write here that we have 50 cents a share. If you remember we issued 11,000 shares. Um, so I think that should be 5,500. So if you announce a dividend you're going to debit either dividends or retained earnings. Either one's acceptable. If you use dividends, then later it will be closed into retained earnings. And because I'm declaring it, announcing it, and legally obligated, I haven't paid it yet. So I have a current liability called dividends payable. So over here on the balance sheet, we would see our liabilities go up. Dividends is a temporary count uh, affecting retained earnings, so stockholders equity would go down. And that's how we balance the balance sheet on the right side of the equation. Um, as much as we feel like that dividends sometimes should go on the income statement, it does not. It's only about between you and the owners rewarding the owners. And we haven't paid it yet, so there's no cash. Okay, next we recognize service revenue $20,000 on account. So here we expect the customer to pay us. Um, there is no cash. So we have an accounts receivable. And I'll put service revenue. Many companies have service revenue and sales revenue. Um, so what we have here is an asset. Service revenue is a temporary account under retained earnings, a subset. So stockholders' equity would also go up. The owner's claim increases. And this is one of the few times we've so far had any change to our income statement, our P&L statement, or profit and loss. We do have more profit, and we have no cash. But we do need to track Bob North, our customer. So I'm going to set up a subsidiary ledger for Bob. And it's a debit in the journal. So it will be a debit in the subsidiary. Okay, next we sold a part of our land, which probably isn't something we'd likely do. And <laughs> I just realized the uh, selling price got dropped off somehow, or I don't see it. Um, so, if we sold it for 12000 we originally bought the entire piece of land for twenty. So if we assume if we take the $20,000 historical cost, divided by four, one-fourth of it is the cost of the land that we're selling. We're selling the land that costs 5000 and receiving 12000 for it. So I'm going to show cash coming in for twelve. 
Um, I'll skip a space. Land going out for five. And so most of the land I still keep. Obviously we don't balance. You're receiving more than you're giving up. Um, the difference between the 12 coming in and the five going out is you're better off by seven thousand dollars. So I'm going to credit seven thousand. Oops, not like that. And if you sell something and you receive more assets than you're giving up, we have a gain, which is actually a revenue. So I'll just call it gain revenue. Um, as far as the statements go, um, cash, let's look at all the assets. We'll do we'll net them together. So cash is an asset. Assets are going up. But land is also an asset, and that's coming down. So it nets to a net increase of 7000 to the asset side. Um, gain revenue is a retained earnings account. That means stockholders' equity goes up, so that's how we balance the balance sheet. And our profit and loss is going to be higher. Our profit will be. And then, of course, cash. Cash is increased. If you sell an investment, it's going to be under investing. Okay, I think we got all that there. Um, lent money to suppliers. And we don't have a company name, so I'm going to call it. Oh, yeah. Um, well, we're going to use the same supplier that we had before. So it's super supplier company. Okay, if we're lending money, then we're actually having a notes receivable. And we're lending $6,000. And so we're giving up cash. So if you look at this, um, let's do it this way. We're receiving, at, we're, assets are going up by six but they're also going down by six cash. So it's an asset exchange. Well, I'll do it this way, like we did before. And nothing happens yet. Well, the interest we'll deal with later. It has to be passage of time. And cash goes down by 6,000. And notes receivable is considered a type of investment. And then we would go ahead and track that. We'll put super supplier here. And it's a debit in the journal, so it's going to be a debit in the subsidiary. OK, next we paid off um, what we owe on the inventory purchase. So um, if you remember, we have accounts payable. because we were billed for it, we didn't pay it when we first acquired it, and now we are. So this time we have what? Assets are going to be going down. Liabilities are going to be going down. And nothing on the income statement for cash flow. Cash is going to go down. And inventory, certainly what we originally bought, part of your day-to-day -day, so that would be operating. Okay, next we finally acted on our con signed contract that we sold goods um, to our customer on account. So here we have accounts receivable at the retail price and sales or sales revenue. So I would suggest make it two separate entries between you and the customer, what's the deal? Usually it's either cash or accounts receivable, and then the other side is either service revenue or sales revenue. And then because we're using perpetual inventory, we also want to update about the inventory that used up. So here we want to use our wholesale price or cost. So that means assets used up become expenses. So cost of goods sold expense kind of a long title there, is what we paid for the goods originally. And the asset that we're using up, of course, is inventory. So I'm going to want to take this together when we do this. Um, so let's look at all 
everything has to do with assets. Um, accounts receivable is an asset, so that's increasing by 40. And if we look through this, inventory is also an asset, and that's going to go down by 15, so minus 15. So the net impact from this sale is that the assets are going to go up by 25,000, which is the gross profit. Sales minus cost of goods sold, is, gross profit is 25,000. Um, and then next, we just mentioned, um, we don't have to do the calculation, but sales revenue of 40,000 minus cost of goods sold expense of 15, again, is the 25,000, which is the gross profit. So retained earnings in net would be affected favorably. It would be going up. And you can see then the balance sheet balances. Your income statement, same deal. It would be improved, the profits by that. And of course, there's no cash. Um, and then since we have a subsidiary ledger for accounts receivable, we would look here somewhere. It's accounts payable. Okay, there it is. So we would pick up Alice at this point. And it was a debit of 40, so it's a debit to the subsidiary ledger. Hopefully got the right number of zeros. Not so good on the zeros. Okay, we paid salaries. We know it's much more complicated than that. Wouldn't you like to be paid your gross pay? I would. Um, but we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> So we'll have salaries expense, so cost of doing business, and we paid cash. So over here, it's, it's just common of any type of expenditure where you're, you know, you've got cash going out. You're going to have less assets. And retain earnings is going to go down for the salary's expense, less profit, and less cash. A lot of lesses. And the cash flow will be operating. Okay, we collected cash from Bob North, the customer, okay, which December 19th, um, we saw the event for that. So here, we should be having cash coming in. And you go back and look, we had billed Bob North, so we have an accounts receivable. So that's going down. So we have cash, uh, we have accounts receivable going down by 20, and we have cash going up by 20. So it's an asset exchange, and nothing on the profit side because we affected the revenue earlier when we build the customer. So we don't have to do revenue again. But we do have cash this time. So cash is going to go up and it's operating. Um, and because it's Bob North the customer, I need to find Bob over here somewhere. And it's a credit to accounts receivable in the journal. It's a credit in the subsidiary ledger. And we could then um, draw our line here. And the balance would be zero. So we have all that history of Bob in one place. Um, finally, we paid the dividends that we declared on December 16th. If we come back up here, um, we declared $5,500. And notice again, we have the dividends payable. So I don't need to debit dividends. I've already done that. So I'm going to simply just pay the bill. So the liability comes off. And we have less cash. At least it's a cash dividend. There are other types of dividends. Over here, I'm just going to see my liabilities going down and my assets. Um, no effect on the income statement and for cash flow purposes. Uh, rewarding the owners goes with the owner's accounts. Common stock is in financing. Dividends also in financing. Okay, I think we're down to the adjusting entries. Again, here's the accruals and the deferrals. 
Um, so let's see if we can identify what type of adjustment and then we'll move into the entry. So we had prepaid insurance, now we know we started in December, we've only gone through one month but the year is over. Um, so we're going to adjust for one year and I think it's not 12000 we spent 1200 if I remember right. So there's the 1200 um, bought on December 1st, the policy started. December 1st. So we take a zero out there. Um, so this one should be good. I tried to pick math that was relatively easy. <laughs> nice round numbers. So it's 1200 divided by 12. So as you can imagine, it's $100. The type of adjusting entry um, we're dealing with. Um, I guess I'll flip over here for a minute. Um, if you look, Prepaid insurance, it's really assets used up. So we do want an expense and we want the asset to come down. So pick something that sounds good. Insurance expense. And the asset is prepaid insurance. No cash. If you're doing cash here, you're thinking about the earlier entries. This is strictly um, updating what's what already is on the books. Um, so assets used up should mean that assets go down. Expenses as usual. A fact retained earnings, so stockholders' equity goes down. And any expense will cause your profits to go down, and there's no cash. Okay. Next, we want to adjust for services earned. If you remember December 6th, we collected 9000 in advance. Um, so here, it was a three month, if I remember right. Maybe we should look back up here to see. Um, yeah, it was for three months um, period of time. So, first of all, what type of adjustment do we need? If we think back to that, um, we collected money in advance, we created an unearned revenue. So I think if you look at this, um, it was def we deferred the revenues to begin with, but now we want to look at earning the unearned. So it appears that we should be recognizing a revenue and reducing a liability. Okay, so I'm going to debit unearned revenue, and we'll do the math here in a sec. And that's what makes the um, adjusting entries harder because it does. If you have to think about titles, you also have to do some calculations normally. Um, so if we if we got three months, um, if you look at the three month period starting in December, you got what 31 days December, 31 days January, 28 days February. So that's average is like 30 days a month or 90 days. Um, and then we can ask ourselves, well, it wasn't a full period, so. December has 31 days, so if I go 31 minus the first day, which is 6, and that's since you don't count it, that's 25 days in December. If we assume it's earned evenly throughout the period, then I would take 25 days over a three-month period of 90 days times 9,000. So if we do the cal calculation, 25 divided by 90 times 9,000. And surprisingly enough, you get 2,500. Can't always get the numbers to work out even though. <laughs> uh, you can try. So over here we have what? Minus liabilities. Revenue is a retained earnings account. So stockholders' equity goes up. All on the right side of the equation. Um, income statement bottom line goes up and again there's no cash. Okay, depreciate the equipment is very much like the expired insurance. So it's going to be the assets used up um, category. So we need an expense title, depreciation expense, and we'll have a separate one for each different type of property, plant, and equipment. And this one again is a little more complicated we set up a separate account called accumulated depreciation, um, allowing us to show to leave the original historical cost in place 
and then to track um, what's been used up. If you remember straight line depreciation, it goes like this. It's the cost, which if we go back on December 11th, it's 80,000, minus salvage, it's 4,500, divided by the useful life. And of course, it's not a full year that we have passed, it's only one month. So I would need to do 1 over 12. So let's see if we can actually calculate that. 80,000 minus 4,400. Um, divided by 9, it's 8,400 a year, and then divided by 12, um, 700, I remember, yes it came out even, yeah it did. If it didn't come out evenly, go ahead and round it to the nearest dollar. Again, depreciation is very much based on estimates. When you look at the three numbers that we're looking at, two of them were, were guessing. So always round your depreciation to the nearest dollar. Um, so assets used up, we would expect to see assets going down. Um, expenses are retained earnings account, so stockholders equity goes down. We have less profit, and that's it. Okay, then we want to accrue interest on our notes payable. If we go back and look at the terms of the note, um, it was taken out December 11th. 5 year, 10%. So we'll do the math here in a sec, but what type of adjusting entry do we have for accrued interest on a notes payable? Okay, it sounds like we use the language accrued. It should be down here somewhere. Um, surely if we borrow money, we're going to owe interest. So it's going to be an interest expense. So accrued expense sounds like a winner. Um, and so we need a debit to expense, credit, a liability. Okay, so we're going to call it interest expense, interest payable. And next we'll do the math, the fun part, right? So we take the principal times stated interest rate times, and then how long do we have it? Um, we had it one month. Well, not even one month, did we? We took it out December 11th, so 31 days in December, minus the first day, which you don't count, which is day 11. So that's 20 days. So we're going to do 20 days, and I'm going to go ahead and use the business year, which is 360 days. Um, your textbook may, or may use 365, but um, I'll always accept that. So then if we do the math for it, we've got principal times interest rate, which usually always is quoted as a yearly rate, and then the time factor of 20 days divided by 360 days. Of course it doesn't come out evenly, so we're going to just, just use 444. Um, don't worry about the cents, and that's going to be true usually for tests and everything. Um, okay, so accrued interest will mean that we have more liabilities and retain earnings under stockholders equity will be going down. Uh, we have less profit and that's it. A lot of fours. <laughs> um, next we're going to look at supplies used. Okay, so expired insurance, depreciation of equipment, supplies used are all examples of assets used up. So we're going to use an expense first, like type, and then the asset going down, and then just a question of how much. Um, we're brand new, we didn't have a beginning balance, we purchased 2000 but we'd really need to look at the beginning balance also if we had one. Um, we counted the supplies at the end and there's only $100 left, so it looks like, what? 2000 minus 100, $1,900. Um, so if everything is gone, then you expense the whole thing. And most of it, of course, is. Oops. Okay, so we have assets going down and stockholders' equity going down as retained earnings and profits going down. 
Okay, this time we're going to accrue interest on a notes receivable. So if you look, think back to your adjusting entry, this is going to be good news. We're going to earn interest on a notes receivable. You know, we, we expensed interest on a notes payable, but here this is an investment for us. So this time the accrued revenue is going to work. Um, the interest is going to be good news. We're going to have interest revenue and interest receivable. So this is an accrued revenue. And interest revenue. Oops, can't type. Same type of calculation though. We're going to take the principal, which is 6,000, times the interest rate of 8%, again, assumed per year. Um, and then we're down to time. So it was the fun part. It was taken out the 21st, so it was 31 days in December, minus um, 21. So we, we've had the note only 10 days. And honestly, I guess with materiality, a concept, it's possible that we wouldn't even do an adjusting entry for this one. But let's assume it's, we should. <laughs> so we have 10 days out of 360 days. So it doesn't matter if it's a one-year note, five-year note, six-year note. It's 8% per year. I didn't mention this up here, but with the notes payable, it says a five-year loan. It's 10% per year, each year. Um, so let's see what we have for that. We've got principal times interest rate times time. Okay, 13, we're just going to round it to $13. I hate to record cents on these things. <laughs> um, so we have assets going up and retained earnings going up because of revenues, temporary account. And of course your profit's better because you have a revenue. Okay. And then finally we have accrued interest. The good news is this is the last entry. Yay! So here are the folks that work for you. Maybe the pay period is not even over yet. It could be an hourly pay period. I mean not hourly, a weekly pay period. <laughs> so we want to be sure we include all costs, whether or not we've paid people, whether or not, in this case, the period's over with. Um, because of matching, we want to time everything in the right period. So an accrued expense is like the accrued interest on the notes payable up here. Um, so we have a liability. We have stockholders' equity going down from the expense because of retained earnings. And we have less profit. Okay, so I hopefully we've updated everything with the subsidiaries that we needed to, and we've gone through all the transactions. And so in the next videotape, we'll take the journal entries, post them to the ledger, and eventually do all the steps in the manual system.